Hey everyone, how's it going? Today I want to start out by asking a very strange question. If you had to pick one aircraft to nickname Hellplane, which one would it be? And more specifically, if you had to pick one aircraft from World War II era Germany to nickname Hellplane, which one would it be? What about an alternate reality Germany that used magic to summon zombies? Which of their planes would you pick then? Personally, I think there's one plane that clearly makes the most sense. A plane that really fits the spirit of the name, since it had this alarming tendency to scream at its targets. And that is the Junkers Ju-87. Now, side note here, what I'm referencing is the game Zombie Army 4 Dead War, which I decided to pick up again because I wanted to play a zombie game. And oddly, or at least oddly to me, the Hell Plane that you see in the game is a Dornier Do 217, which certainly wouldn't have been my first or even second choice, but, you know, whatever, I didn't make the game. But the Ju-87, an icon of World War II era Germany and possibly the face of the Luftwaffe early in the war. Considering the overall design and performance of the plane, it being kind of the face of the Luftwaffe was rather surprising, as it, on the surface, appeared to be incredibly outdated and not up to par with other aircraft in the World War II era. And indeed, the Ju-87 Stuka was a bit more on the rudimentary side, and it being more rudimentary nearly played a part in it never being accepted for service, which we'll get to a little later. The design of the Ju-87 can be traced all the way back to 1928, with the Ju-K-47, a two-seat monoplane fighter that kinda looked like a proto-version of the initial Ju-87 design. But the Ju-87 proper wouldn't really be designed and worked on until about five years later, with the Nazis coming to power and looking to significantly revamp and grow Germany's aerial forces, and in their desire to do so, in the realm of dive bombers, they put forward effectively two plans. The first plan was to find something for the immediate, something that could be quickly introduced into service and give Germany something solid enough until a more advanced and capable aircraft could be designed and introduced. This effective stopgap ended up being the Henschel HS-123, a single-seat biplane that was officially introduced in 1936. The second plan was to look more to the future, for an advanced dive bomber that would take longer to develop, but would also help put Germany on more equal footing with the rest of the world. And kind of de facto, the Ju-87 Stuka was to be the plane of the future. While not explicitly stated, in January 1935, when the Reich Air Ministry officially started this second plan by issuing the desired specifications to Junkers, Arado, and Heinkel, they based their specifications around the Ju-87, which certainly gave it a leg up on its competition, and it was an advantage that they nearly squandered several times, actually. First taking to the air on September 17, 1935, the Ju-87 V-1 wasn't a terribly attractive aircraft to the Luftwaffe and Reich Air Ministry for several reasons. For one, with the initial design sporting a twin fin tail, this led to the first prototype being destroyed early in 1936, after those fins basically disintegrated mid-flight and caused the plane to crash, killing the test pilot. If that wasn't bad enough, the fact that it used a British Rolls-Royce Kestrel engine arguably might have actually been worse. It's no secret to us here today that Germany was basically destined for war, and the fact that the Ju-87 used an engine from a country that Germany would be fighting against was a major point against it. Now, both of these issues would be remedied as a single tail would be introduced 
and a German-made UMO 210, later UMO 211, would be installed. It was with this new setup that the JU-87 would go head-to-head -head with its main competitor. That competitor wasn't Arado's submission in the AR-81, nor was it Blom and Voss's private submission in the HA-137. But it was Heinkel's comparatively advanced design. This is the Heinkel HE-118. In the pre-war 1930s, Heinkel and designers Siegfried and Walter Gunter were relatively prolific and present in numerous Luftwaffe design competitions, and their overall results in them were mixed. On one hand, they would design the HE-111, which was the Luftwaffe's primary bomber in the early stages of the war, and on the other hand, they designed two failed competitors to the BF-109, a failed Schnell bomber, and the very problematic heavy bomber that was the HE-177. In this period, the Gunter brothers were seemingly fixated on a couple specific design elements, and these elements were present on multiple of their prospective designs, namely in the wings having rounded elliptical tips, like the Spitfire for example, the wings overall being inverted gull wings, and the tail surfaces being rounded as well. All of this was generally done in an effort to increase top speed and overall performance. And indeed, on several of the designs that they made, it did boost performance. With the HE-70 Blitz, for example, setting several speed records in the early 1930s. Several of these features made their way to the HE-112 fighter, and while it was technically a decent plane, it was overall inferior to the BF-109 as Heinkel would later discover. But in the early stages of the HE-112's development, that began its development before the second dive bomber plan was actually initiated, Heinkel very clearly had faith in their new design. So when that second plan for a dive bomber was put into action, and Heinkel received the specifications, they decided to use the HE-112 as a baseline for their new bomber. Measuring in at 11.8 meters long, 15.39 meters wide, and 3.1 meters tall, the HE-118 was overall larger than the HE-112, and I guess if you squint, you probably could mistake one for the other. The general layout of the initial design, at least to me, brings to mind later Rolls-Royce Griffin-powered Supermarine Spitfires, or perhaps something like the Yak-9 or the Yak-3. You know, if you squint and maybe have cataracts. The overall design was rather sleek and kind of advanced looking for the era, with its relatively sleek and thin fuselage, inverted gull wings with elliptical rounded tips, retractable landing gear, and a relatively small cockpit and canopy that bubbled out from over the wings. In essence, it more resembled a late-war fighter rather than a pre-war dive bomber. Up in the nose, the HE-118 would initially share a flaw that the initial JU-87 had, in that it was powered by a British-made engine in the Rolls-Royce Buzzard, which was a lesser-known and short-lived improvement of the Rolls-Royce Kestrel. So immediately, even before testing, and just like the JU-87, the HE-118 had a negative mark against it that would need to be remedied down the line. Manned by a crew of two in that small-looking cockpit and canopy, the overall armament of the plane actually depended on the number of crew members. Under its normal two-crew setup, the HE-118 would have three total guns, more of a token armament than anything else really, with two forward-firing 7.92mm machine guns and a defensive rear-firing 7.92mm machine gun, controlled by the second crew member. But for the important part of the dive bomber, the bomb payload, the size of the payload increased when the second crew member and third gun was removed. In its normal two-crew setup, held in an internal bomb bay in the fuselage, 
a 551 pound explosive could be carried. In a single crew setup, that payload increased to 1,102 pounds. An internal bomb bay was presumably used to help improve speed and overall performance. But really, that didn't lend itself terribly well to dive bombing. When in a dive and the payload would be released, because it was carried internally, the bomb itself would maintain the momentum of the plane and would remain internal until the plane moved, which sounds rather dangerous, really. And Heinkel knew this, and in that bomb bay was this swinging arm. And when the HE-118 would go into attack, the bomb bay would open, and the arm would swing down, and the arm carried the bomb. And the bomb would then be carried externally until it was released. Perhaps this was overly complex for the era, but it was very interesting, and in theory it would help improve flight performance. Upon taking to the air for the first time, in late 1935 or early 1936, the HE-118 did indeed showcase improved performance. After the arrival of the second HE-118 prototype, shortly after the flight of the first one, this one being outfit with a German-made engine in the Daimler-Benz DB600, and also presumably not being equipped with any of its armament, the HE-118 would manage to hit a top speed upwards of 270 miles an hour, solidly above the early JU-87. This performance made it rather clear to the Air Ministry that of the three official competitors, the JU-87, the HE-118, and the AR-81, and the unofficial competitor in the HA-137, only two of them were really still worth pursuing the JU-87, and the HE-118. The competition was effectively a battle between simple and advanced. The JU-87, with its lesser speed, fixed landing gear, and overall blocky and more rudimentary appearance. And the HE-118, with its more advanced and complex Bombay setup, retractable landing gear, and design elements that sought to boost top speed. Looking at it purely from the performance specs, the HE-118 should have been the runaway winner. But because they were dive bombers, how each of these planes attacked ended up giving the JU-87 a bit of an advantage. The JU-87, with its simple yet rugged frame and solid maneuverability, it would dive nearly vertically for its attack. And essentially, the closer to vertical you dive, the easier it is for the pilot to aim and strike his target. On the other hand, the HE-118, at best, could dive at just 50 degrees, and any more than that could lead to serious damage to the aircraft, if not its destruction. But still, the HE-118's better overall specs made it pretty enticing. So enticing, in fact, that on June 9, 1936, under the recommendation of Wolfram von Richthofen, then a member of the Air Ministry's technical office, work on the JU-87 was ordered to be ceased, making the HE-118 the effective winner. But this decision was rather strange, considering that the JU-87 was actually shaping up to be the better dive bomber and probably the better military aircraft, due to its more optimal dive angle, its overall ruggedness, and its comparative simplicity that would make it much easier to produce and work on in the field. The HE-118 was more equivalent to a more complex general attack aircraft, and it was probably because of that that it was initially selected over the JU-87. Von Richthofen wasn't exactly a fan of the dive bomber concept, and his bias against it likely played a major role in his decision to cease work on the JU-87. Unfortunately for him, though, the next day, with noted fan of the dive bomber concept Ernst Udet being named chief of the technical office, that cessation order was itself ceased, and the JU-87 was back in the competition. But Udet still wanted to give the HE-118 a chance. 
and on June 27, 1936, Udet himself would take the HE-118 into the air, and despite getting a crash course lesson on how to fly it, he seemingly ignored his teacher, despite the fact that the HE-118 was limited to a 50-degree dive angle, Udet decided to throw the plane into a near-vertical dive, which then led to the propeller ripping off the plane and the tail basically disintegrating, forcing Udet to bail out. This crash effectively signaled the end of the HE-118, and the JU-87 would win the competition. Now, normally this would be the end of the HE-118 story, but after being rejected, it ended up living on in a more indirect fashion in a different country, and it would be a small but important part of the evolution of aircraft technology. For the first thing, Heinkel was given permission to sell the design to other countries, and one of those buyers was Japan. While the HE-118 sold to Japan, ended up having a similar fate in that it tore apart in testing and was destroyed, Japan allegedly thought very highly of the design still, and decided to design a dive bomber based around it. This became the Yokosuka D-4Y Suisei, and it ended up seeing a production run around 2,000 strong. For the second thing, Heinkel was a major contributor to early German jet engine technology and they would design the first flight operational jet engine in the world in the HES-3, which was the engine that powered the HE-178, the first aircraft to fly purely using jet power. But the engine had to be tested first, to see if it provided enough thrust to sufficiently power a plane. And to test it, Heinkel still had a few HE-118s laying around, and decided to use one of them to test the HES-3. With a jet engine strapped to it, the HE-118 took off under propeller power, and mid-flight, the engine was activated, and the HE-118 successfully flew under jet power. Then the jet was deactivated, and the plane landed under propeller power. So thus, the HE-118 ended up playing a pretty small but still quite important part of early jet technology. So even though it ended up failing, it nevertheless had a rather strange career, being in proximity to more important and bigger things and occasionally playing a role in those things. While technically advanced and on paper, a better plane than the JU-87, it being advanced, at least in part, contributed to its downfall, along with its shallower attack angle and alarming tendency to rip itself apart when going past that angle. But ultimately, with its proximity and occasional contribution to greater things, the HE-118 was like a player on a team that doesn't play very much, but somehow they have multiple Super Bowl rings. You know, a real Jimmy Garoppolo of the 1930s. Did you know he has two Super Bowl rings? All right, and with that, we're going to go ahead and end for today. So thank you all for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. You know, playing Zombie Army 4, the games pretty blatantly don't take themselves seriously. But one thing that made me stop and just go, I mean, all right, was when you come across a zombified armored personnel carrier and when the doors open on it and zombies come out, the APC has a rib cage, like a really, really big human rib cage. Like, why? But anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you learned something. So, see ya.